Right, so we'll start off, uh, we're looking at the uh, Paper 1 Numeracy Intermediate Tier from November 2020. The grade boundaries, um, usually 20 marks gets you onto the grades, 30 marks gets you a D, 40 marks gets you a C, and about 52 gets you the grade B. Okay, so if you do a sort of running total of the marks as you go along, after question one, you've earned five marks. If you get question two right, you've earned 17 marks. If you get question three right, you're up to 23. So by the time you get to question three, you're already grading. You've, you're, you're in the E's. Okay, question four, 26 marks. Question five, 29 marks. And then question six, takes you up to 40. So by the end of question six, you're into grade C, so long as you've got everything right. 46, uh, what do we got then? 46, 57. So by the time you get to the end of question eight, if you've done everything right, then you don't even have to answer the rest of the questions, you're gonna get a grade B. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. So the grade C boundary there is a question six. So I'll, I'll stop take a break at that point you're given two formulas those of you that have done the higher tier you see a lot more formulas than that on the higher tier on the intermediate tier you're only given two formulas okay so non-calculator paper um, the the things that come up on the non-calculator paper one are metric to imperial conversions okay so the ones that were worth remembering because they don't give you them is that eight kilometers is approximately five miles. So if you're converting between kilometers and miles, you need to use that. One liter is approximately 1.75 pints. Is another one. And then the third one is um, one kilograms is approximately 2.2 pounds. And that's not pounds in value, that's pounds in, in weight. So those three you're expected to learn. And they're not easy to remember. So like I said, if that's the last thing, you, the last little bit of information you read before you go in the exam room, write it down as soon as you're allowed to start writing. Area trapezium, um, we, we are, I think, gonna use that in this paper. So then we come to the first questions. The first question, grade E in challenge. So Marion buys some blueberries and strawberries. Does that matter to the question? No. But it's giving you here the cost per kilos of the blueberries and the cost per kilo of the strawberries. Marion buys one and a half kilograms of blueberries and she gets £6.80 change from a £20 note. Calculate the mass of the strawberries uh, that Marion buys. Just sit, sit where there's a um, paper goes. So this is what they're actually asking us to do, is work out the quantity of um, strawberries that she buys. Okay. So when we're figuring out our strategy here, I want to work out how much money has been spent on fruit, okay? So because I know that she has been given six pound 80 change from a 20 pound note, everything else has been spent on fruit, okay? So if I work out the difference between those two, that's how much she spends on fruit. So work out um, how much has been spent. So I've got to do 20, take away £6.80. Now you could do that as a proper calculation, or you can just do it in your head. It doesn't matter. Um, but we can the first word say that you wrote? work. 
work out how much has been spent. So £20 less £6.80 and then whatever your strategy is for working that out. So we've got two, three. So I think you need to just cross the board. So she spent £13.20 on fruit. Now I know what mass of blueberries she's bought, and I know that the blueberries cost £4 a kilo. So there's enough information there for me to know how much she spent on blueberries. So one kilo is four pound, half a kilo would be two pound, so she spent six pound on blueberries. So that now means I can work out how much she spent on strawberries. It's going to be the difference between everything she spent and what she spent on blueberries. Seven pound twenty. So she spent seven pound twenty on strawberries, and strawberries cost three pound sixty for win one kilogram. So two kilograms would cost her seven pound twenty. And that's a very common type of question. It might be sausages and potatoes or whatever. But that type of question comes up quite often. So when you see on the topic list money calculations, that's the sort of thing. All right. Any questions on that? No. That's good. Like I said, that's a sort of grady question. All right. So look at the next one then. So question two. <coughs> Again, early in the paper. So um, relatively low level maths. But this is flagging up here that this is the OCW question. Okay, so this is the one that these two marks here are for your organization and communication and writing. Doesn't mean you're gonna to need to write an essay. It just means you have to make sure that um, whoever's marking it can understand what you're trying to do. So Susie buys a Jack Russell dog. The dog costs her 450 quid. Okay. Pet insurance costs 18 pound a month and the food costs seven pound a week calculate the total cost of buying insuring and feeding susie's dog for the first year you must show all you're working okay so we need to set out what we're going to do here so clearly um i've got seven pound a week and there are 52 weeks in the year, so I can work out how much it's going to cost for food. Okay, so dog food will cost 52 lots of seven pounds. Whatever method you've got for non calculated multiplication is what you need to use here. Okay, so if, if you can do it in a column like that, that's fine. If you want to do it uh, using sort of brick wall method, whatever, 
strategy works for you, stick to it. But you've got to have a strategy. Okay, you need to be able to do these multiplications. So seven twos are fourteen. Four down carry one. Five sevens are thirty-five and one thirty-six. So it's going to cost her uh, three hundred and sixty-four pounds on dog food. So then we've got the pet insurance, which is eighteen pound a month. So insurance will cost eighteen lots of twelve. Okay, so you've got to be able to do that without the glater. I'll do it the Chinese wall method, just so that I'm showing two different types. Okay, so we're going to do 18 times 12. Are you familiar with this method? No? Yeah, yeah some of you are similar. Have if you do long multiplication, that's fine. Whatever method you've got, as long as you end up with the same answer as I do. So with this method, um, you write the two numbers that you're multiplying by on the outside, and then you multiply each square. So it's going to be 8 times 1 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. 1 times 1 is 1, so you write that as 0, 1, and 1 times 2 is 2. And then what you do is you add up along your diagonals, starting at the bottom and working up. So we'll have 6, 11, 2. So 18 times 12 is then giving you the answer 216 pounds. So the insurance costs £216. So I've worked out the pet insurance, I've worked out the food, and the dog is going to cost her £450. So the total cost for year one, or first year, however you want to write it, is going to be... Done the food, haven't I? Yeah. 364. Okay, so it's the, it's 364 for the food, 450 for the dog, and 216 for um, the insurance. So you got to bless you. So you add up the columns: 10, 6, 12, 13. Um, what do I got there? 3, 8, 12. Is that? So I haven't written essays, far from it, but I'm showing the examiner that I'm cl clearly thinking about the maths that I'm doing. I've broken it up into the maths for the dog food, the maths for the insurance, and then the total cost. And in each of them, I'm keeping consistent units. So I've got the pound symbol and the pound symbol. So that would get me the additional two marks. So I get four marks, for the maths, I hope if I've done it right. Have I done it right? I have a different answer there. 10, uh, 12, 13, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, that should be 1030, should it? Yeah, agree with that? Yeah. So I wouldn't have got six marks because I did my adding up wrong. Happy with that? Okay. Part B. Reminder. One inch is approximately 2.5 centimetres. So this is now got me thinking, oh, right, this is a, this is a conversion units. Remember the first thing we wrote down on the front page were those equivalences. Any other ones they give you. You arrive late. Yeah. So you haven't got to Britain down. No matter I put them back on it. 
So the height of a fully grown Jack Russell dog is between 25 and 30 centimetres. A fully grown Jack Russell dog has a mass of between 6 kilograms and 8 kilograms. Complete each of the following statements. The height of a fully grown Jack Russell dog is between blank inches and blank inches. So I know that uh, 25 centimetres is going to be 10 times bigger than that, yeah? So it's going to be 10 inches. And then 30 centimetres. So 2 inches will be 5. So that's going to be 5... Um, 2 inches is going to be 5 centimetres, and that's going to go in um, 6 times 2 is 12. Okay, so using that conversion that they, they're providing you with, you can work that one out. For the second one, you've got to remember that um, one kilogram is approximately 2.2 pounds. Okay? And our dog is between 6 kilograms, which would be 6 lots of 2.2. And eight kilograms between that. So any conversion other than those three which we wrote down, they'll give you. Okay? So you wanna scribble those down quickly, girl. So what I was saying on the front. Sorry, Josh. That all right? Yeah, so these ones, girls, what I was saying is sometimes there are things you want to just get down on the page because you, you won't remember them. So you're trying to memorise them as you go into the, the exam room and then as soon as you're allowed to write, drop them on the page. So eight kilometres is approximately five miles. One litre is approximately 1.75 pints and a kilo is 2.2 pounds. Pounds, yeah. Okay, moving on. Question three. So the map shows a part of Wales. Write down the bearing of Rill from Carnarvon. So this is where you're going to need these. Okay, so when you are measuring a bearing, write down the bearing of Rill from Carnarvon. So where are you standing taking your measurement? In Rill or Carnarvon? Carnarvon. So we're going to find Carnarvon on the sheet and it's there. You measure a bearing from north. North is up the page. So on Carnarvon, draw in your north. Okay? So when you measure a bearing, you measure it with zero at north, and you measure around in that direction. So I'm standing at Carnarvon, I'm looking north, and I'm turning until I can see Rill, which is over there. So the angle I need to measure is this one. So get your measurer. You put the centre of your measurer on Carnarvon. And you line your zero up with north. And then you measure in that clockwise direction until you're hitting 
the um, the red line you've drawn to rel. Okay, so I reckon that's seventy degrees. If you got sixty-eight, sixty-nine. 70, 71, 72, you get the marks. Okay, the examiner will give you a two degree tolerance either side. Okay, however, bearings are given as three figures. So if it's less than 100 degrees, to make it a bearing, you've got to put the zero in front of it. And if you didn't do that, did they penalise it? Oh, I'm putting the marks here. So they're, th they're called three-figure bearings. So if you're less than 100 degrees... So what's the bearing? So the bearing is the angle you turn from north yeah. to what you're looking at, okay? So if, if I'm looking up here, if, if that's north, mm -hmm. and I want to get the bearing of me from you, yeah. I would be turning until I'm looking at you and then measuring oh. that turn. Okay? And it's always in that clockwise direction. I wouldn't be going in yes. the opposite. So as far as a learning thing, that's all you have to learn. Measured clockwise from north. Name the place on the map that is on a bearing of 145 degrees from Colwyn Bay. Okay, so I've now got to go to Colwyn Bay. Draw the north up. Put it on my map and measure 145 degrees. So 145 degrees is there. We're going along the outside scale because we're counting up from zero. So I've marked 145 and I can see that it's going through Corwen. So that's bearings. They come up very often on a numeracy paper. We've then got map scales. Okay. So when you're looking at an, an, uh, an OS map or something like that, they tend to give the scale as a ratio. Okay. So this is saying one unit on the map is going to be 20,000 times bigger in real life. So it's, it's independent of units. If you've got something that measures in, is in, measures in inches, one inch on the map would be 20,000 inches in real life. One centimetre on the map would be 20,000 centimetres in real life. Gwen measures 3.5 centimetres on this map. Okay, So one centimetre on map will be 20 thousand centimeters um, on life in life will be 20,000 centimeters actually so if I've got 3.5 centimeters then it's going to be 3.5 lots of that Three point five times two. Three point five times two. So three times that is seven. Yeah. So it's going to be seven followed by four knots. Okay. So seventy thousand centimeters, actually. But they don't want the answer in meters. Sorry, in centimeters. We've now got to turn that into meters. So what have we done to turn that into meters? Divided by a hundred. Hundred, yeah, hundred centimeters in a meter. Okay. So that's another thing you need to be able to do is convert from one metric unit to another. So divide that by a hundred. Well, dividing that by a hundred will do what to it? Knock off the two noughts, yeah. So it'll be 700 meters. OK. 
Okay, move on. Question four. A new runway is to be built at an airport. The plan below shows some of the angles. Bryn has been asked to complete the plan by finding each of the missing angles X, Y and Z. Right, diagram's not drawn to scale. So even though I've got one of those, I can't use it. Okay, it's not going to give me the right answers because those aren't actually 60 and 70 on the diagram. What's the, um, what's the key things in that diagram that give us access to this question? What, what information is on that diagram that's helpful? Well, those, arrows, those arrow things, yeah? So we've got parallel lines. So when we've got parallel lines, that opens up Z angles, F angles, corresponding angles, alternate angles, and so on. So, there's my parallel lines, there and there. Usually, but not exclusively, the first one is the easiest one to find, then that one, then that one. Okay, so you're looking at that X angle there, that X, and you're trying to see, right, well, what else can I use? It's... Ooh, hang on. What have you done there? Say it again, Tom. Uh, 70 and 70, same one. Third side of that. That one there and that one there? Yeah. Yeah, so that one's 70, yeah. Yeah, so that's 140. Take that away from 360, because it's 360 all the way around. Yeah. Then you've got that's, uh, that and what? Then you half that, and that's the same as angle X. Yeah. It's a very complicated way of doing it, but it works. Yeah. Um, what the the one you were more likely to spot on parallel lines? So you you've done it, Tom, by um, using opposite angles, and the fact that they must be the same as well. Okay, but the parallel line thing is the Z angle. So you've got if that's seventy there, that one's seventy there. Yeah, does that ring bells? Yeah. Yeah. So that's seventy. That's seventy. Then this is on a straight line. Out of one hundred and eighty. So X is one hundred and ten. Okay. So we've got X. Right. Let's have a look at Y. Well, Y is also on a straight line there. So what's Y going to be? Correct. 150. Okay, so yeah, so that's 180 take away 65. Now, Z angle land again. I got a Z angle there. So if that one's 65, that one's 65. Can you see that? Yeah. And then we got a straight line here. And then that, so that's 65 here, is it? So this, this one's 65, God, I can't see what we look at you. Yeah, but is opposite that 65? No, well? no, because it's not going all the way through. It's not just a pair of intersecting no. lines. But where my pen is there is a straight line. Yeah. Okay? So I know that Z and 65 and 42 must add up to 180. Yeah, so it's, what's that, 107? Yeah. Um, that's like no, 7. No, 93. Not 93? No, 73. Oh. 73. Yeah, well done. Okay, so th those three must add up to 180. So you've got 65 and 42 is 107. So that's going to be 73 degrees. Okay? So parallel lines. Question five data. This is where we're going tomorrow, really, with this. So in an office, the ICT technician recorded the number of attempts each of 75 employees took to enter their correct password into a computer. The results are displayed below. So frequency, how often? And this one, number of attempts. So what 
does this line here tell me in the context of the question? Brilliant. Okay, so this is telling me that out of the 75 employees, 34 of them put their password in correctly the first time. This one's telling me eight took two attempts. This one's telling me 28 took three attempts. And this was telling me five took four attempts. What is the modal number of attempts taken to enter the correct password? Um, mode is the most, yeah. One. one. So the modal number of attempts to enter the correct password is one because there's more of those than anything else. What was the median number of attempts taken to enter the correct password? Okay. So this is what we we're doing this morning, although we weren't doing it off a graph. So the median, how do we find the median? Put them in order. Put them in order, find the middle. Yeah. Okay. Now, they're already in order. Right. Yeah, because the first 34 are one. Okay. If I wanted to turn this into data, raw data, I'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, 34 ones. Then I'd have eight twos. Then I'd have 28 threes. And then I'd have five fours. Okay, so if I wanted to if I wanted to write them out as a long list, I could do that. And I want to find which one. Which one is going to be in the middle of 75 employees? Which employee am I trying to find in that list? So we're looking for the middle. So half, what would half of 75 be? Yeah. 37.5. 37.5, yeah. So I'm looking for the 38th person. in order okay because that the 38th person would have 37 people lower than him or her and 37 people higher so if i'm going to count to find 38 people the first 34 i've got guess one 35 36 37 so the median number is Two. Okay. Oh. Let me explain yeah. that again. No, I, I get it because there's thirty-four there, and if you count on this, then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking for the thirty-eighth person. The thirty-eighth person is going to be two. A further ten employees attempted to enter their correct password into a computer. The median number of attempts for all these 85 employees is three. Did any of these 10 employees take fewer than three attempts to enter their correct password? Okay. So how many, how many employees are there now? And another 10. So now 85 employees. So where the median is going to be which person? Middle. I know it's the middle, so which one? If you've got 85. Um, 40, uh, 43rd, isn't it? It'd be 42 either side. Okay, and that's got to put him, that 43rd person has to be in Group three. This is quite a tricky thing to, to get your head around. Okay? So because the middle person has got to be in 
in there. If any of those ten are in the one or two, it's not going to count in to that third group. So the answer is no. Okay? Because the 43rd won't be in group 3. So basically, you're going to tick no and say that you're looking for the 43rd person. That's the first really tricky, tricky question to come up so far. And then we're on to question six. So question six, if we get question six right, we got our grade C. Because we got everything right so far, apart from I got that adding up wrong. Okay? So we're on question six. And it's another money problem. Okay? So let's lift out from this um, what we need to actually use. So Rowan is going to make some muffins. To make the muffins, he buys muffin cases, ingredients, and one flag per muffin for de decoration. A pack of 16 muffin cases costs 22 pence. The ingredients to make six muffins costs 25 pence. And a bag of 12 flags costs 40 pence. So we're going to be using that information. Rowan buys four bags of flags. He plans to make as many muffins as possible and have no cases, ingredients or flags left over. He will sell the muffins for 30 pence each. Calculate Rowan's profit when he sells all the muffins he makes. So, right, I might be totally wrong. Well, that. well, let's hear your plan. First thing, I would say you divide them by four because he's got four bags of bags. Yeah. So he's doing four times a bit all. Yeah. yeah. And then. <laughs> and then However much that is, oh, I know you don't know how many muffins he's going to make. So because <laughs> because you know how many bags of flags he's going to buy, right? Every one of those flags is going to be stuck on a muffin. Oh, yeah. Twelve flags, okay. Yeah, so how many muffins is he going to make? Forty-eight. Forty-eight muffins. Okay. So, twelve flags. Um, sorry, four bags of flags. means he's got 48 flags altogether. And we know he's going to he's going to have nothing left over. So that means he's going to make 48 muffins. And sell 48 muffins. So how many packs of muffin cases is he going to need to buy? Three packs. Yeah? Two packs. Two packs would be 32 cases. He needs three packs of muffins. Sorry, three packs of muffin cases to have 48 yeah? He needs to buy three packs of cases. So, how much will three packs of cases cost him? So, three times twenty two, sixty six pence. How much uh, will the flags cost him? Well, 
£1.60. So I didn't put that in. So I know it's going to cost. It's going to cost him one pound sixty for the flags, sixty-six pence for the cases. What else is there? It's two. Eleven. The ingredients, yeah. yeah. So how many lots of ingredients is he going to have to buy? So six muffins, eight because six eights are forty-eight. Yeah, he needs to buy eight lots of ingredients costing eight times 25 so eight lots of 25 is two hundred pence two pound So total cost of making fins will be two pound plus one pound sixty plus sixty six pence. So that's two three pound sixty four pound. Well, what? It's not going to end in a five. Four twenty-six. Yeah. Right. So it's going to cost him four pound twenty-six, and we will work on how much profit he's going to make. So 30 times 48, yeah, would be how much he's paid. So 30 lots of 48. So if I do three lots of 48 and add a naught. So he sells for fourteen pound forty. Okay. So how do we work at the profit? Hold it. Fourteen forty. Take away four pound twenty six using any non-calculator method you like. Um, can't take six from zero, four, one, zero, one. So he's making 10 pound 14 profit. Right. So we've got B and C to do, and then we're done with, we're into the great B stuff. So Jerry makes biscuits. Each box of biscuits cost him 80 pence to buy, to make. He sells them for four pound a box. Calculate, so 80 pence, four pound a box, percentage profit. We didn't do this last week when we were looking at percentages. But in order to work out a percentage profit or loss, it's going to be it's going to be that. So how much profit is he making? He's making three pound twenty. Out of four, and then you turn that um, into a fraction, into a percentage by times it by a hundred.
might be easier actually to do it as 320 over 400 times 100. Okay, so you can divide by 10, top and bottom, divide by 10, top and bottom. So you end up with 320 divided by 4. Um, 4 eighths are 32. And uh, zero. So it's what have I done wrong there? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's wrong because it isn't out of four. It cost him eighty pence to make. So it should be. 320 over 80 times 100. So we can divide that by 10. And we know that 8 goes into 32 four times. So that's going to be the same as 8 into 3200. Zero, zero. Which is 400, that's better. He makes a 400% profit. And then the last one before I hit pause. Chloe makes flapjacks. A pack of flapjacks costs Chloe 60 pence to make. She sells the pla flapjacks for a profit of 30%. For how much does Chloe sell a packet of flapjacks? So this is in the first half of the paper. So it's a grade D. It's not, it's not one of the complicated ones we did last week. So we work out what 30% of 60 is. Okay. So 60 pence, 10% of 60 would be 6. So 30% of 60 would be 18 pence. So costs of 60. To make that profit, she's going to have to sell it for... 78 pence. 60p plus 18p. Which is that one. Okay, so we got that point and we have racked up 40 marks. Okay, so we're on the grade C as long as we've got everything right. Okay. Question seven. Rosie recorded the rainfall and the number of hours of sunshine each day last week. So the vertical axis is rainfall in millimeters and um, the sunshine hours, uh, sun hours of sunshine is along there. So whenever you're looking at a graph, just like we did with that, that one we were looking at mode and median earlier, just pick a point and make sure that you understand what the graph is telling you. So if I pick that point there, that's telling me that there was one day which had 4.6 hours of sunshine and 5.8 millimeters of rain fell. Okay? So on one day last week, the number of hours of sunshine was low and the rainfall um, was lower than on any other day. Which day was it? So which day, which of those am I going to be able to circle from that graph? Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, can't tell. Can't tell. Yeah. You can't tell because they're not in order it doesn't there's nothing on that graph to link it to the days it's joining sunshine with rain not days so you can't tell rosie says there will be a positive correlation between rainfall and the number of hours of sunshine next week so looking at the graph that you got there neve Jose, yeah. looking at the graph that you've got there are we looking at a positive correlation? 
Is it possible to do when it goes up further up there, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not then. So it's not, because what's that one? Going down. Going down, which it's is negative. negative, yeah? So there will be a positive correlation next week. Is Rosie correct? No, because this week it's a negative correlation, so it's more likely to be negative. No, it, said, it says at the top it, that this is last week's one, and that's... Yeah, so we, we're going to use that to predict. Oh, okay. Yeah, if it was in two months' time, we probably couldn't do it, but we could have used last week's weather to get a pretty good idea what's going to happen yeah. this week yeah so more likely to be negative okay b at 3 p.m. each day last week, Rosie recorded the wind speed and the number of birds feeding in her garden. So the vertical axis now is wind speed and the horizontal one is number of birds. Was there a correlation between wind speed and the number of birds feeding in Rosie's garden? No. No. There's no pattern to that. Yeah? No trend. There is no pattern. Or no correlation. The greatest wind speed at 3 p.m. last week was on Tuesday. How many birds were feeding in Rosie's garden at this time? So the greatest wind speed last week was on Tuesday. So which dot, how can I tell where the greatest wind speed was going to be? The one that's up the top, yeah? So, seven birds. so that's going to be the Tuesday, and that's going to relate to seven birds, yeah. On Wednesday last week, the wind speed at 3 p.m. was a quarter of that on Friday. So the wind speed is the vertical. So I'm looking for two dots that one of them, if I multiply them by four, will give me the higher or one of the higher ones if I divide it by four will give me the lower okay wind speed at 3 p.m. was a quarter of that on Friday so I'm looking for two dots so if I start with the lowest there that one there what's the wind speed of that one 1.5 if I if I double and double again, I get six. Is there one at, one at six? Yeah, two. So times four equals six, and that one is six as well. Okay? So the wind speed at 3 p.m. was a quarter of that on Friday. So which, is the, which, which day has got the higher wind speed, Wednesday or Friday? Friday. Friday, uh, Friday. Friday yeah? So Friday is going to be 6 and Wednesday is going to be 1.5. Question 8. <coughs> Ratio. Albert Terry and Gareth are going camping. Albert Terry and Gareth paid for a tent between them. The amount they pay each paid for the tent was in the ratio of 1 to four to six respectively and Gareth paid 66 pound 36 towards the tent calculate the cost of the tent so a t g one four six okay so the order that the names are given to you is going to correspond to the order of the digits in the ratio. And then they're telling me that Gareth paid 66 pounds and 36 pence. Okay? And that's equivalent to six parts of the overall cost of the tent. Do you divide that by six to get what? Yeah, that'll give you one part, yeah? So we're going to do 
66 pound 36 divided by 6 one one zero six so Albert paid 11 pound and 6 and then what do we do to work out how much Terry paid times by 4 so Terry Four six is twenty four four zero zero. So Terry paid forty four pound twenty four. Calculate the total cost of the tent. So eleven pound and six, forty four pound and twenty four, sixty six pound. And 36. We're going to add those up. So 10, 16, 6, 11, 12. So the total cost of the tent would be £121.66. So when you're working with ratio, the really important thing to figure is whether or not they're giving you the total amount or whether they're giving you part of the total amount and you've then got to work out the other part. So with this one, um, they're giving you the part of it. They're giving you Gareth's share. And then the next one's a bit, bit of a nasty one for an intermediate tier paper. Or, sorry, no, a non-calculated tier paper. The charge to stay at the campsite has increased by 5% each year for the last two years. Two years ago, the charge was £24 per night um, for a large tent and three people. Oh no, this one's alright. Calculate the current charge per night for a large tent and three people. So this is a bit like the compound percentage question we did last week, but where um, uh, we're not allowed to use a calculator. So in year one, so it started off at £24. And we've got to work out what 5% of it is. Okay? So 10% would be £2.40. 5% £1.20. So at the end of the, so at the start of year two, it's going to cost two pound for uh, sorry twenty four pound plus one pound twenty. So the first year you went there. You're paying £24. At the start of the second year, it was going to cost you £25.20. And then at the end of that second year, it's going to go up again by 5%. So 10% would be £2.52. So 5% would be, uh, God, £1. pound 26 so at the end of the second year it was going to cost you 25 pound 20 plus 1 pound 26 so it's going to go up to 26 pound 46 okay so it's going to start at 24 pound and then it goes up by five percent which is 1 pound 20 so at the end, when you go there, at the start of the second year, you're paying £24 plus £1.20, and then you've got another 5% rise on that. So 10% divided by 10, you get £2.52, half it for 5%, add it on. Okay.
What's your final answer? My final answer. Mm -hmm. Twenty-six pound forty-six. Does not matter that No. Unless I haven't read the question properly. Three people, yeah. So they're telling you two years ago it was twenty-four pound for a large tent of three people. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's gone up by five percent. Uh, yeah. No. So twenty-six pound forty-six. Hurrah. Question nine. No, question C. Diagram shows the ground sheet of a tent. The area of the ground sheet is 6.8 square metres. The width of the ground sheet is 2.2 metres. Calculate the overall length of the ground sheet. So what do I need to do here? What do I need to do here? I've got to work with an area, and the shape that I've got there is not a regular shape. Split into two shapes. What two shapes should we split it into? Across there, yeah? Okay, so I'm going to split it into those two shapes. Now, because I split into those two shapes, I can work out what the area of this rectangular bit is. Yeah? What's the area of this bit going to be? 2 times 2.2. 2 times 2 .2, which is 4.4. So how does that help me when it comes to the shape above? You know the bottom line is 2.2. Yeah. And the top two, I don't know how you work out the like height. Line. Okay, we're going to come to that. Scarlett's going to help us with that first. Do you have to take by 3.4 Good. Okay. So I know the area of the complete shape is 6.8. So the area of this bit is going to be 6.4 minus, sorry, 6.8 minus 4.4 .4, which is 2.4 okay so I now know that the area of this shape up here is 2.4 and I go back to the front of my exam paper because in the front of the exam paper it tells me how to work out the area of that shape okay so the area of the shape is going to be half bracket a plus b what's the b bit going to be yeah so 2.2 yeah times the height equals the area and i know the area now we've just worked out to be 2.4 okay so let's work out what's in brackets uh, 4 H equals 2.4 half of 4 is 2 so 2 H is 2.4 so what's 1 H going to be? 1.2 so I now know That height there is 1.2. And what the question wants us to find out is what the overall length of the ground sheet is going to be. Three point two, yeah. So it's going to be the height of the rectangular part, which is two, plus the height of the trapezium part, which is three point two meters. Okay, so it's just 
It's just remembering that that formula was given to you. Okay, number nine. Loci. We're going to do this next Monday, is my current plan. So the scale diagram below shows Hayden's garden. His garden is 27 metres long and 18 metres wide. The scale used is one centimetre represents three metres. Hayden is planting a tree in his garden. He decides that the tree must be planted 15 metres from the fence and equidistant from the house and the fence. Draw suitable lines on the diagram and show where Hayden should plant his tree. So we've got the scale diagram of the house. It's giving us the scale. So let's do the let's um, work with that 15 meters from the fence first of all. Then, how am I going to work out the boundary for 15 meters from the fence? There's the fence. There. Okay. Not a clue. Five centimeters. Five centimeters. That way to there. Five centimeters there. Five centimeters down. It's going to be five centimeters across. So, if I asked you all to stand five meters from the wall behind you, yeah. you'd all walk backwards five five paces. Then, yeah. Yeah. If I was looking at you from above. What would I see? Your heads all in a straight line, yeah. parallel to the thing, yeah? So five, 15 meters, using this scale, 15 meters will be um, Three, seven, uh, five, five centimeters. Five centimeters. Okay, so I'm gonna measure five centimeters in from both sides the tree is going to be and can be anywhere on that line Neither you've got an unhappy look on your face well we might see five centimeters it's like the other side of the house because you've got that <laughs> say it again you've got that you meant to go down I've done a straight line oh. oh hang on never mind penny <laughs> dropped Right, look. She drew up. Five down. centimetres from the fence. Oh, hang on, I was going the other way. Ah, right. So you would, you do it five centimetres from the wall? Yeah. Or from the house? From the hedge. From the hedge, or you go that way. All right, okay. So it's from the fence. Now, so it's going to be on that red line somewhere. But in order to determine exactly where, we've got one more thing we've got to work with. Equidistant from the house and the fence. So again, Tom? Equidistant from the house and the fence, so it's so the same. It's going to be the same distance from there as it is from there. Now this will be this will be easy next week because we we will practice this. Where am I going to stand? So if you if you imagine we're in the corner of this room, okay, and I want you to stand to an equal distance from this wall. And that wall. So you go like make a square kind of thing. Five centimeters down from the house. On that line. No, it's not five centimeters down. So I, I'd go there, go there, there. So you go like, it won't be five, would it? No, let me put you misery. You've got to cut that angle in half. Okay. If it's equal distance from that and that, ninety, forty-five. So you would draw a 45 degree angle, okay, so you go in north, 10, 20, 30, 40, 45, once I've drawn it now it might make a bit more sense to you. If I stand anywhere on this red line now, I'm going to be the same distance from the house as I am from the fence. Anywhere on that line, it'll be, if I'm there for example, I'll be, um, what's that gonna be? 
2.5 centimeters from the house and I'm going to be 2.5 centimeters from the fence so in order to be equidistant from two lines you've got to go halfway between the angle so where is my tree going to be That's it? There. Which is five centimetres. That's it? So you could have just done it five centimetres by five centimetres anyway. What do you mean? Well, because where that point is, it's still five centimetres down. You didn't have to do the whole angle thing. You could have just done five by five. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether that's a fluke or not, Tom. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> that might be a fluke, or it might be a touch of genius. I'll have a think about that. <laughs> Let, let's hope it's a fluke, is it? Right. Number 10. Sampling. You may or may not have done sampling last year. Um, if you didn't, this isn't going to make much sense to you, but we'll see now. So there are 600 pupils in the school. Eight of these pupils are to be selected to discuss changes to the school uniform. The head teacher has a spreadsheet of the names of all 600 pupils. There are 600 rows of pupil names in the spreadsheet, starting at row one. There is one pupil name on each row. The head teacher uses a systematic sampling method. So it's a head teacher um, used to teach maths clearly. The first pupil selected on the head teacher's list is a boy whose name is in the 25th row. Oh. Um, is a boy whose name is in the 25th row. Give the row. Give the row numbers of the spreadsheet of the other seven pupils who would need to be selected. So the way systematic sampling works is if you want to work if you want to select eight people you want to work out right how many is going to be an equal gap between each of the eight people you're going to pick oh there we are so i want to out of my 600 i want to get eight groups so um eight and six doesn't go eight into 60 7 8 56 remainder 4 8 into 40 goes 5 so i want every 75th person so we're going to select every 75th person but we're not going to start with the first person we're going to start with the 25th so I'm going to so the first person who's selected is the 25th. The next one would be the 100th. The next one would be the 175th. Then you're going to have the 250th, then the 3 325th, then the 400th, then the 475 and then the um, brain dead again. Help. Five fifty. Five fifty. Thank you. So that's systematic sampling. The only difference to that is that the head teacher started at the twenty fifth. I could have started at the twelfth. You could have started at the forty fourth. We select the first one randomly, and then we count on seventy five from it. So selected at random. Right, number eleven. What do we got left? Okay, so we're we're in the grade B land now. Quarter an hour ago. So Miner is planning a charity event to be held at the hotel. 
A section of a straight line graph uh, showing the hotel charges for this event is shown below. These charges include a single payment for the room hire and the cost of one drink for each person attending. Miner decides to pay the room hire cost herself. She decides the price of the tickets so that she will be able to make 500. Sorry, garbled my words then. She decides to price the tickets so that she will be able to make 500 pounds to give to charity. How can you tell from the graph how much the room hire is going to be? Uh, Why? It starts, it starts there. So zero people. Okay. So the cost of the room hire is going to be a hundred pound. Right. Calculate the selling price of each ticket if Miner plans the event for fifty people. Okay. So for 50 people, we go up to the graph and we work out what each little square counts for. So it's going from 200 to 300 in five jumps. So each of those is going to be 20 quid. So for the 50 people, the cost is going to be 220, 40, 60, 80. But a hundred of that, she's going to pay. Um, so less the room. So that's going to be a hundred and eighty. But she wants to make five hundred pound profit to give to charity. How much? Five hundred. And she's on one hundred and eighty. So the overall cost for the room hire is two hundred and eighty pounds. We got that off the graph. Yeah. But she's going to pay a hundred herself. So she's not passing that cost cost on for the tickets. Okay. So that's come out. So overall, tickets need to come to £680. And she's going to divide that by 50 people. So 680 divided by 50 is the same as 68 divided by 5. So we got five, one, remainder one, three, remainder, go on, I'm getting tired now, 15, three, five into 30 goes six. So each ticket is going to cost £13.60. Do we go through it again? So off the off the graph, fifty people is going to give you two hundred and eighty. Okay, so the hotel is going to charge you two hundred and eighty pound, but you're not going to pass the cost of the room higher onto the tickets. So we can take the two hundred and the hundred pound off, um, leaving one hundred and eighty pound. Which needs to be charged on the tickets. On top of the ticket, on top of the hundred and eighty pound, we also want to make five hundred pound for charity. So the total of all the tickets being sold needs to come to six hundred and eighty pound to cover the charity and the hotel. Um, and we're going to share that then between fifty tickets. Okay. Calculate the selling price for each ticket if Miner plans the event for 400 people. Okay. So, where you've got to be careful with this is 
when we take the hundred pound off we only do that once so let's say for example for 400 people you go well 200 people we can read that off the graph and it's 820 pound and then you want to double it to get 400 people but if you double that you're doubling the hundred pound payment so 200 people costs 820 pound So 400 people costs four, uh, 16 40 pound. But we have to take 100 off that, is it? Well, we have to take 100 off that twice. Yeah, but don't we want to pay for one room where? Yeah. And we doubled it. But we doubled it. So it would be one... <laughs> Four. Four, zero. Because we took that 820, reading it off once, Tom. Yeah. Okay. If we double that, because we want 400 people. Yeah, you okay? So actually, fourteen forty plus we want the charity. So plus the five hundred for charity is going to be nineteen forty, and then we're dividing that by four hundred people. Well, that's the same as 1994 divided by 40, which is the same as 19.4 divided by 4. Uh, so what have we got there? We've got 19.4.16.3. Four eighths of thirty two. Four pound eighty five. So that's tricky because of that double charge. So we've got to take two hundred off, not one hundred. Didn't like that one. Okay, done that one. Number 12, two more questions then. A square piece of card measures one meter by one meter. Calculate the area of this piece of card. Give your answer in standard form. Oh. oh. times 10 to the power of yeah okay so one meter by one meter if I want this in millimeters how many millimeters are there in one meter first of all turn it into centimeters hundred centimeters and one centimeter has got 10 millimeters okay so times by 10 equals a thousand millimeters so if you want to work at the area of a card that's measuring a thousand by a thousand it's going to be one followed by six zeros and then to turn that into standard form you want a number between one and ten multiplied by a power of ten 
So it's going to be 1 times 10 to the power of what? Yeah. How did Miss Rook or Mrs. John show you how to get that 6? You can only count the zeros if it's just one digit. If that had been 2.2... Then you've got to count that as well. Two two, yeah. Right, so, so that's the way you were shown, is it? All right. So whatever method you were taught, as long as you're happy, that that's times 10 to the 6. And then it changes when you do it on minus to power. Yeah. 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 Just um, what I'll do, when we practice standard form, which may not be until we do in maths, I'll show you how I do that. Part B is horrible. Some fab fabric shrinks when it is washed. A piece of fabric is washed twice. After the first wash, the area of the fabric is 75% of the area of the original piece. So it's shrunk to what size? Oh no, that's fine. So it's, it's going to be 75% of that. So we're going to multiply it by 75%. And then it's washed again. And we end up at 90% of the area. And after these two washes, the area is 2,700. And I want to work out what the original was. It's the opposite then, isn't it? 2,700 divided by 9. Yeah. Divided by 90, isn't it? So divided by 90% and divided by 75%. But I'll show you a sort of more logical way of doing it. Because it's a non-calculated paper. So what's 75% of this decimal? Oh, not 0.75. Not 0.75. And what's 90% of decimal? 0.9. 0.9 or 0.9. Okay. So that's what we've got to do. So you're going to have to do 2,700 divided by that and divided by that without the calculator. Isn't very nice. Bear in mind that with a with sort of e equation or, or something where we've got an equal sign, as long as we do one thing to one side and do the same to the other, it keeps balanced. Okay? So if I, if I want to get rid of this 0.9, first of all, I can do that by multiplying by 10. If I multiply this side by 10, I've got to multiply that side by 10. So then I end up with original times 0 0.75 times 9 is 27000. So by choosing to multiply by 10, I've changed that decimal into 9. But if I multiply the left-hand side by 10, I have to do the same by that, which means I end up adding a 0 to that. Now, I know that 9 goes into 27 three times. So if I divide this side by 9 and divide that side by 9, I end up with original times 0 0.75 equals 3000. If I times by 10, and times that by 10, I get that to 7.5. On that side now, I got four zeros. If I double 7.5, it gives me a nice number. If I double this side, I have to double this side. So then I get original times 15 equals 60,000. 
and I know that 15 goes into 60 so if I divide both sides by 15 I get the original on this side and on that side I get 4000 so the original is 4,000 centimetres squared. If that was on the calculator paper, it'd be easy. It's what we were doing last week. So you just do 2,700 divided by 75% divided by 90%. But because it's on a non-calculator paper, it's how you deal with that. So I've just show, tried to show you there one sequential way of doing it. If you've got your own weights, that's fine. Last question. And remember, you only need to get 52. So, you can leave that one out, as long as you've got everything else right. A box for mints is to be made in the shape of a hexagonal prism. The cross section of the box is a regular hexagon. The volume of the box must be more than 2,000, sorry, 230,000 volume greater 230,000 cubic millimetres. So the box for the mints looks like that. So it's 10 centimetres long and its cross section is made up of six triangles which have got a base of 30 and a height of 26. Going back to the front page you've got volume of a prism here. It's the area of the cross section times the length. Okay, and that's what we've got here. If we can work out the area of the cross section, we multiply it by the length and that gives us the volume. So the area of the triangle, area of single triangle. What's the formula for area of triangle? Uh, half uh, times height times base. That's it, half times height times base. So it's going to be half times 26 times 30. Half of 26 is um, 13. So you've got 13 times 30. 13 threes are 39, so that's going to be 390 square millimetres. That's one of the triangles. I got six of them. So that's going to be 390 times 6, 0, 54, 18 and 5, 23. So I now know that the area of the cross section of the box is 2340 and to work out the volume I've got to multiply that by the length of the box. So don't fall into the last mistake on the paper. You've got to change the 10 centimetres into millimetres. So you're going to have two, three, four, O oh, with another two zeros. And the question is saying, um, show that this would make a suitable box for the mints. Is it greater than 230,000? Yeah. Yes, it is. So, yes a suitable box.